Greetings and welcome to No BS Baking. My name's JP, and today we're going to hit with part two of the uh, little segments I've been doing on pH. Now, what I want to do is I want to talk a little bit about sourdough process as it pertains to acid developing in a dough. Not really talk too much about sourdough per se, but talk about the characteristics and how acid builds and these types of wonderful things. When you're talking about acid building up in a dough and pH, you can't get any more relevant than talking about sourdough. So without uh, delaying any further, let's get into it and let's wrap this pH thing up. Let's talk a little bit about sourdough because it's really good to understand uh, how pH works when you start getting down into the real low ends of the pH scale. So the most prevalent type of bacteria in your dough system will be lactobacillus. However, other bacteria communities will want to join in this party. Most of them are kind of related to lactobacillus. They do a similar type of thing by producing acid, albeit different types of acid. And then you have some bacterial communities that um, are not related and uh, do not produce acid. Uh, and these are from environmental conditions that you have where you're doing your bulk fermentation or you're storing your so starter or whatever. So as I mentioned, there are many other types of bacteria that want to come and get involved in this dough system. Which ones come, how hard they party when they're there, and how long they stay depends on pH. Now, many of these bacteria, they are not like lactobacillus, which really will be there from start to finish doing its trip. Some of these bacteria will come in at certain pHs, where they like it, where they're happy, where they groove. When the pH changes beyond their happy point, they're, they're out of there. In other words, they stop uh, contributing to the dough system. Temperature, of course, plays a big role in the speed at which pH changes, and so therefore temperature also is a very big component. And of course, time. The amount of time that these, these particular bacteria, some or others, um, are in the dough system and contributing and partying away will often determine the type of flavor that you get from it because they produce different acids beyond just lactic acid, such as acetic acid. Now, these are called the flavor notes, and many bakers play around with this uh, their temperature and their pH and their time in order to kind of customize the flavor note or the particular characteristics that they're looking in for in their bread. Okay, so real quickly, we're going to just talk about controlling flavor. Okay, so the most important thing to know here is that if you look along here, you can see that as you move up in temperature, more lactic acid is developed. Lactic acid gives you more of these creamier, sweeter, dairy-styled notes. You know, almost fruity. You almost get like a fruity smell up there, right? As you start going into the cooler temperatures, produce more acetic acid. So if you're making your starter in a warmer environment, you're going to get more of these sweeter dairy-style notes. If it's in a cooler environment, you're going to get more of these uh, tangy, stronger, sour type notes. And this is the reason why many people will do a final proof inside the refrigerator. They're really looking at getting that real nice tang out of their uh, sourdough, and so ultimately they'll keep it in a very cool environment. Now, the two different types of starters are generally a high water starter or a stiff starter. And so these also come into play. High water starters have a tendency to move much quicker and develop much faster. And, uh, you know, in, in respect, so the low water starters move a lot slower. 
So the bakers are playing right in here. They're, you know, fooling around back and forth to see what they can do. A little bit warmer temperature, a little bit cooler temperature. And this is where you do all of your balancing. So um, it's important to understand that hydration levels of your starter in conjunction with the temperatures that you've got will all be uh, determining factors in the quantity and the types of acid that's being developed in your dough. So when you're thinking about pH, remember that pH is a measurement of the acid or alkaline strength that you have in a particular uh, solution or dough, etc. But pH does not tell you how much acid is actually in that dough or in that solution. Let me explain. So as I mentioned, pH is one measurement for acid strength or alkalinity in a dough system. Let me explain here. If you take 10 milliliters of acid and you pour that into a glass that contains 100 milliliters of distilled water, and then you take a pH of that, you're going to see that your pH, let's just say for this example, comes out at around 4. So you take that same acid and you fill that up into a, into a glass and you fill that right up to the 100 mil line, no distilled water in there, and you take a pH of it and it also is 4. And this is part of the reason why uh, pH is only really half the story. It tells you the strength of the acid, but it does not take into consideration how much acid. And how much acid that's in your dough, uh, especially sourdoughs, is a very important uh, part of the whole equation. So with respect to acid development in your dough, Remember, every sourdough is different. Now, let's just say that you decided to do a day of baking. You're going you're gonna to make a sourdough and you contact your neighbor and you tell him what you're doing. He says, hey, I'm doing the same thing. You said, wow, fantastic. You know, you guys both shared recipes. So you started your starters kind of around the same time. You used the same recipe. Uh, you basically got your processes very, very similar, um, using the same fermentation times, and you call up your neighbor and you say, hey, um, I just checked mine, uh, my dough after uh, the bulk fermentation, and wow, the dough came out at a 4.1. He says, I just did the same thing. I just pulled mine from the bulk fermentation, and guess what? Mine came out at 4.1 also. Fantastic. You guys both basically, same procedures, same recipes, and you both came out at 4.1. That is fantastic. However, you sit there and you're looking at your bread and you're saying, oh, I'm going to take this over to my neighbors. I got to let him check it out. And he's doing the same thing and he wants you to show you his. Now, when you guys look at the two different loaves of bread, you're thinking, holy smokes. I mean, these are totally different breads. Mine doesn't seem to have as much volume as my neighbor's does. His is a little bit colored in a different way. What is going on? Other than maybe some minor irregularities with respect to your oven and your baking time or something along those lines, you might, you're going to have different looking product. But remember one thing. Every sourdough is different because every sourdough has a completely different quantities of acid. Now, these are the acid buildup, as I've talked previous, depends on the party that's going on in there, the temperature that you're storing your starter at, the temperature that you're bulk fermenting at, the time you're giving it, the, the, the time, the temperature. All of these factors come into play as to who and which bacterias attend the party. Flour. You guys could be using the exact same flour from the exact same company, but you've got a different batch from, uh, you know, it's, it's a little bit older or it's, it's a newer batch. All of these little differences come into play um, with respect to the bacteria yeast party. Again, location. Maybe you've put your, you do your bulk fermenting into an area that's 
that's a lot cooler, but it's also maybe susceptible to different types of bacteria in that area. All of these things all play a major role. And what I'm trying to say is that literally this list could go on and on and on as to why you can get completely different quantities of acid in your bread. And so with respect to uh, lactobacillus acid and all of its buddies building inside of your sourdough system, generally at around the 3.5 mark, thereabouts, it'll level off. It's not going to get much more acid past that point. So you get a leveling off effect. The most important thing to keep in mind is that along with lactobacillus and uh, some of the other good bacteria that you've uh, that have uh, penetrated your dough system and have contributed to the flavor and the characteristics of your sourdough, there's some bad ones that are floating around. And these are just the standard ones that are in the air and, and uh, in the environment every day. You know, maybe you got your cat and your dog uh, have, running in and out of the room. Uh, you've got, uh, you know, your kids came in from outside and, you know, or got their handprints all over or smeared some who knows what on your counter. You know, it's little things like that or even just from the air. There is stuff flying around. The good news about sourdough is that once you hit this 4.2 mark right in here, generally all of those bad bacterias are t toasted. They're killed. So naturally, uh, the uh, pH levels come down to a point that basically kills off any of the uh, bad bacteria, and then provides you with all of the wonderful things. So it, it has like a sterilization effect on pathogenic bacteria. Most sourdoughs sit around 4, 4.1, 3.9, 3 3.8. 3 You're kind of in this ballpark, so you've passed this threshold of 4.2, and you are generally good to go. So we've talked about pH only being half the story. Uh, so what's the other half? Well, the other half is how much acid is in your dough. And as we mentioned when we talked about sourdoughs, you can have the same process, the same recipe, and you can have completely different acid levels inside a dough, such as sourdough. So how do I find out how much acid is in this dough? Well, the test is called TTA. Now, you don't really need to think about this too much because it requires a bunch of extra equipment. I mean, you'd be setting up your kitchen like a little lab. This is mostly used by the industrial or commercial baking industry, you know, in their test kitchens for when they really want to try to dial in on uh, some flavor or the characteristics that they're looking for or checking the effect on acid development through their process. This is more... This is really nerdsville over here, okay? So don't really sweat it too much. Uh, I wish I could have given you a simpler answer because I told you how important it was, but that's the answer that you got. So uh, I hope you enjoy that one. <laughs> All right, hold on. I'm not going to just leave you hanging there. Here's a couple of little things that I just popped into my head. Uh, you can eliminate whole grain flours from your feeding. So if you're using whole wheat and you use that as part of the flour or all of the flour in your sour starter, try using like an all-purpose white flour. Okay, just cut that out. Whole wheat, grains, the acidic, take that right out of the equation and then uh, that's going to help. Feed your starter more regularly. If you normally feed it once a day, um, double it up to twice especially before you're getting ready to bake, maybe even three times. And feed it before it reaches peak. Now, if you're making starter, you know what peak is. Uh, refresh it early and maybe refresh it a couple of times a little bit early. Now, that's really going to also help. Now, with respect to your dough, you could potentially reduce your, your bulk fermentation time. Okay, many of these processes call for a four hour or whatever uh, bulk fermentation time. Cut it back by 15 to 20 percent. 
See how that works for you. You can also reduce or eliminate your cold proof. You know, as an example, many of these sourdough um, uh, processes require that you stick your loaf into or your dough into a um, refrigerator, leave it overnight, and it's that cold temperature that actually is uh, instrumental in creating more sour flavor. So reduce or eliminate that and that also will help. So there you go, just a couple of quick tips. Also, sorry, if you're using a, um, a stiff starter, starter, you can do a bath on your starter. Look it up online. There's a there's a there's one really good uh, technical guru out there. He's a sourdough whiz, uh, and um, he has a video on bathing your sour starter. So check him out, um, and uh, good luck. Yeah, it's not that difficult of a process. There's no doubt in my mind you won't get it all sorted out. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you walked away with just a little bit more information than what you came in with. That's always my goal. Help you become a better baker. Help your understanding of baking science and the process of baking. So until next time, keep an eye out for some really cool stuff I got upcoming. And uh, we'll see you then.